Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 156 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name's Larry Erickson. It always is. It still is. It probably always will be. Uh, but uh, I'm here as your renter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things that are important to me, I think worthy of your attention and uh, often of doing something about. If you have any reactions to the show, email them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or you can leave a uh, comment there if you'd rather. Uh, if you do send me email, please include something in the subject line so that it's clearly not spam. And I'll be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm... Um, actually rather slow about email, but you will get an answer. All right, with that out of the way, we're going to get to it. I'm going to start off, uh, as I always like to when I can, with a bit of good news. Just something to cheer you up a bit. You're going to need it later. All right, Crystal Moore is, or rather was, a police chief. In her 20 years on the job, she had never received a reprimand. But suddenly, recently, she got a string of seven reprimands, and then on April 14th, the mayor fired her. Now, the thing is, a lot of people locally believe that the real reason she was fired is because she's a lesbian, and they regarded the reprimands as a cover for the firing. Adding credence to the suspicion is that the fact that the mayor, whose name is Earl Bullard, he was recorded as saying that he would rather leave his children in the care of a drunk alcoholic than someone whose, quote, lifestyle is questionable, unquote. All right, the day after the firing, on April 15th, dozens of residents were picketing City Hall, demanding that more be reinstated. On uh, Other people held a prayer vigil. Uh, On April 17th, the city council moved to strip Mayor Bullard of some of his powers and uh, grant them to the council instead. So here's a case where the community is standing up for her, and and that's, that's really great. It's good news. But here's the real thing why this is good news. Where is it that people are standing up for a lesbian, demanding she get her job back? Where is the mayor who fired her for being a lesbian now actually losing some of his powers and his authority as a result? It was the town of Lotta, South Carolina, population 1400. Justice is coming. By the way, quick sidebar on this. Uh, According to a survey of 40 nations by the Pew Research Center for Global Attitudes Project, the country in the world most accepting of homosexuality is Spain. Uh, A mere 6% said it is morally unacceptable, as compared to 55% who say it is, and 38% who say it's not even a moral issue. The U.S. breakdown was 37-23-35, consecutively. Uh, and by the way, ranked in order of the, uh, of the nations at the rate at which they say that homosexuality is morally unacceptable, Spain was the best of the 40, Ghana was the worst, the U.S. was 12th. All right, it's got some uh, other feel-good stuff. Uh, I got an update on something from last week. Uh, Last week, I gave the Clown Award to the School Cops and Courts of McDonald, Pennsylvania, over the course of 15-year-old Christian Stanfield, who who recorded the bullying he was being subjected to in his math class. But when the evidence was presented to the school, they forced him to destroy the recording. He was threatened with a charge of felony wiretapping. He was charged with uh, disorderly conduct and convicted and fined. The update is a happy ending of a sort. The Allegheny County District Attorney's Office said they are going to withdraw the charge when it comes before the court they deal with on April 29th. Mike Manco, who's speaking for the DA's office, said the behavior does not rise to the level of a citation gets better. Manko also said no one who was authorized to give advice on wiretap or school violation issues was contacted in our office by the school district or the South Fayette police. And it gets even better still. He also said the DA's office has made multiple attempts to contact the cop who issued the citation. They have not heard from him. Maybe he was afraid he'll get picked on. Uh, Oh, and by the way, why is this just sort of a happy ending of a sort? Because so far, still nothing has happened either to the bullies or to anybody at the school. 
All right, moving on from there, it is now time for one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award. And this week, the Big Red Nose goes to the state of Louisiana for a month-long trifecta of buffoonery. First, at the beginning of April, the uh, uh, Louisiana passed with neither the discussion nor debate an omnibus bill that would force the closure of three of the five abortion clinics in the state, and the remaining two are both in the same city. It's similar to measures that have passed in Oklahoma and Texas. It imposes a new additional waiting period. It requires doctors who are doing abortions to have admitting privileges at a hospital within 30 miles and says that any doctor who performs five abortions a year must register with the state which makes their name and the location of their practice public information. Now the claimed purpose of this bill is the safety of women. Because as a columnist for Salon.com wrote, limiting access to basic medical services is much safer than having robust access to uh, basic medical services. Uh, next, on April 11th, a House committee of the Louisiana legislature passed out a bill to create a state book, the Bible, the Christian Bible, be the state book of Louisiana. Oh, but of course, this has nothing to do with Christianity, of course, nothing to do with an endorsement of Christianity. That would be wrong. This is just an endorsement of uh, the Bible. The sponsor of the bill wound up pulling it before it actually came to a floor vote because he said it had become a distraction, which as we all know, as politicians speak for, people have noticed I'm getting flack, so I'm bailing. Finally, last week, the Louisiana House of Representatives voted overwhelmingly against a bill that would strike down the state's long-standing statutory ban on sodomy even though such laws were declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court 11 years ago and cannot be enforced. State of Louisiana, without doubt, you are a clown. All right, I also have an RIP, uh, and this is going to be shorter than it, than it should be uh, because I want to get to something else that's going to take up the bulk of the time today. Reuben Carter has died of complications from prostate cancer on April 20th at his home in Toronto, Canada. He was 76. If you don't know the name, maybe it's because you remember him as Hurricane Carter. He was a professional boxer whose career was cut short when he was falsely accused of murder from an incident, a shooting at a bar in Patterson, New Jersey in 1966. He won a new trial but was convicted again and ultimately spent 19 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. He finally got out in 1985. After his release, he became the first director of the organization, the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted. Now, the thing is, I'm going to talk more about this next week because his case raised things. Uh, uh, tell more about his particular case, about his story, uh, and about the racism in the justice system that was revealed by his case. All of this deserves more time than I can give it now. Uh, I want to address the whole issue of people who were wrongly convicted and the question of how many people are in prison today who should not be only because they did not have the financial resources to defend themselves in court. But that's going to be covered next week. And from now on, I want to move on to the thing I want to talk about this week. So for the moment, I'm just going to say R.I.P. Reuben Carter. And we will get to the rest after this quick break. All right, and we're back. All right, now it is time uh, for our other regular weekly feature. It's the Outrage of the Week. And to me, this is an, an incredible moral and ethical outrage. And frankly, I still, even now, I can't think about it without feeling the anger starting to swell up. On Tuesday, April 22nd, the Supreme Court of the United States upheld the right of the sovereign state of Michigan to ban using race as a factor in college admissions. Put another way, the Supreme Court said that Michigan and the seven other states with similar provisions can ban affirmative action in higher education. Put a bit more directly, the court said that Michigan can actively prevent public colleges and universities from attempting to expand opportunities available to minority students 
And put honestly, the Supreme Court just declared that Michigan can recreate and maintain the institutionalized racism and good old boy networks that produced the sort of lily-white colleges that we tended to see everywhere before, uh, before affirmative action was instituted. And so for a moment, because that term has been used and abused so much and has been subjected to such sneering, we take a moment to remind ourselves what affirmative action actually is. The term was first used by John Kennedy in 1961, using it to refer to the idea of redressing ancient inequalities that had not been addressed or overcome by legislation. Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, said in 1965, and I'm quoting him, you do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bring him up to the starting line of a race, and say you are free to compete with all the others and still just believe that you have been completely fair. On another occasion, he talked about you can't just bring somebody up to the doorway of opportunity and leave them there. You have to make sure that you can help them get across that threshold. The way I describe it, the way I've always explained affirmative action, is imagine you have two people running a foot race. One of those people is wearing a ball and chain. So after a while, one of those runners, the, the one without the ball and chain, is going to be way ahead. You can't just say, wait a minute, this isn't fair. Everybody stop right where you are, take off the ball and chain and say, okay, now it's fair, race on. If you're actually going to have a fair race, you have to do something to undo the past unfairness that created the gap between the runners. That is, you couldn't just passively declare fairness. You had to affirmatively seek it. You had to take affirmative action to address the inequality. Thus the term, and that's what it means, and that's what it's about. And wouldn't you know it, wouldn't you know it, once you got past the obvious stuff, once you got past the obvious bigotries, the obvious examples of racism, once you got past the easy part, it turned out that redressing centuries of iniquity, generations of social oppression and economic inequality, what do you know, it got a little complicated. And that made it uncomfortable for those who benefited from that old iniquity, even if they didn't recognize the benefit they got. In fact, especially if they didn't recognize the benefit they got. Because the fact is, there is a benefit. I benefit. Most of you benefit. By being white in our society, you benefit. It's called white privilege, and of course white privilege exists. Of course it does. Of course you benefit in a thousand ways, a thousand small ways, by having a white skin. You benefit every day, mostly because of the assumptions that people do not make about you because of the color of your skin. Things that, because you are white, people do not think about you. You can move, you can look to any region of this country, but to any region of this country, and you can imagine moving there and finding a place that you could afford and a place you wanted to live and not have to worry about whether or not your neighbors are going to be hostile to your very presence. You can walk past white women in the street without seeing them clutch their purses tightly. You can walk into a store and not have security follow you everywhere you go. You can go to a job, uh, get a job, or go to a school that has some kind of affirmative action program without others assuming that you only got there because of the color of your skin and that you don't really deserve to have that job or be at that school. You don't feel that same wrench in your guts when you're walking down the street and a cop car suddenly starts driving slowly right along with you. You don't have to teach your kids about being sufficiently submissive and deferential to a cop. You don't worry that if your teenage child goes out wearing a hoodie or plays their music too loud in their car that they might get shot down by some gun-wielding George Zimmerman or Michael Dunn. You don't think about any of that because you don't have to. You don't think about how day in and day out you are privileged in so many ways by the color of your skin. And the thing is, of course you don't think about it. Of course you don't.
One of the things that marks social privilege is that it's so natural to you, so part, a common part of your day-to-day -day existence, that generally you are quite literally unaware of it unless you consciously decide to stop and think and consider it. Because privilege is, well, it's, it's just the way it is. The result of that, though, is that when anyone who does not share in that privilege is given any opportunity to do so, to have some share of that same privilege, you feel that something is being denied you, something is being taken away from you, that they are getting special treatment, even though all they want is the same treatment you've been getting all along. You feel they're getting something they're not. You feel you're being denied something. Something which, if you will, you, you instinctually feel, you've been socialized to feel, is yours by right. The result, in, in retrospect, but should have been the obvious result, the predictable result, was that attacks on affirmative action began almost as soon as the program came into existence. And they have con these attacks have continued in legislatures and courts ever since, and bit by bit, affirmative action has been sliced down, trimmed, picked at, and nitpicked until what's left is a little more than a shell that has been subjected to the death of a thousand cuts. Which is bringing us toward this most recent decision. In 2003, in the, uh, in the case Grutner v. Bollinger, this is a case involving the University of Michigan Law School. The Supreme Court ruled that it is permissible for a school to use race as one factor among many in determining who is admitted. The fact that race was even one single factor, though, the fact that race was, quoting this decision, merely a potential plus factor, even that was too much for the good citizens of Michigan who decided this is just totally unfair. So in 2006, the voters passed Proposal 2, which is, uh, as is normal in this case, it was grossly misnamed as the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative, and it banned any public institution of any kind in the state of Michigan from making any use whatsoever of race in admissions or hiring processes. It passed by a vote of 58 to 42. Now, some people sued the state over the ban on its use in college admissions, arguing the amendment was discriminatory under the Fourth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment rather, because it only blocked minority students from seeking preference in college admissions. On April 22nd, the Supreme Court told those people, screw you. Now, this amendment in question, it bars any consider, uh, consideration of race while leaving other forms of preference, such as veterans' benefits or veterans' preference or a legacy admission, which is where the child of a former graduate from that school has a leg up over others. Uh, it leaves those forms of preference unaffected. But screw you. It clearly undermines what the Supreme Court itself, in the Grutner, uh, in the Grutner, uh, Grutter decision rather, in the Grutter decision, the Supreme Court said there was a compelling interest in having diverse student body. But screw you. Oh, but this has nothing to do with affirmative action. No, not one tiny little thing. In fact, the controlling opinion which is written by Justice Anthony Kennedy, went out of its way to insist that this case is not in any way about the use of race as a factor in admissions policies. It has nothing to do with the merits of affirmative action. It's all about and only about whether or not voters in a state can choose to ban it. Oh no, the court said, we didn't ban affirmative action, perish the thought, we just said, you can. In fact, Kennedy brushed off any consideration of the impact of the, uh, of the decision on what, again, the court itself in that earlier, in that Grut Grutter case, had called a compelling interest in diversity. He wrote, quote, where states have prohibited race-conscious admissions policies, universities have responded by experimenting with a wide variety of alternative approaches. But the fact is that states that forbid affirmative action in admissions have seen significant drops in their enrollment of black and Hispanic students at their better colleges and universities. In Michigan in particular, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, black enrollment dropped 33 percent between 2006, when this policy went into effect, and 2012. 
Either Kennedy is incompetently unaware of those facts, or, as I think more likely, he just doesn't give a damn. And that is emphasized by the fact that he called Michigan's ban just part of the ongoing national dialogue about affirmative action. One wonders what, just what sort of dialogue he imagines is going to be taking place in Michigan now with this amendment firmly in place. Because what this, what this decision actually means, what the decision actually says, is that as long as you are the majority, you can limit the opportunities of others. You can limit their chances of overcoming their lack of your privilege. It means if you're in the majority, you can preserve the forms of preference that are of benefit to you while banning the sorts that are of benefit to others. It means that if you have the popular forms of preference, they can stay because preference is okay so long as it benefits the majority. What this case means is that people who, by definition, do not need affirmative action because they are in the majority, because they have that privilege, the people who wouldn't benefit from affirmative action because they don't need it, the people who, because of their unacknowledged privilege, regard affirmative action as something being taken away from them, these are the people who get to decide if you can use affirmative action. That's what the Supreme Court said, or if I want to be particularly accurate, a six to two majority of the Supreme Court said. Uh, George Washington was the attorney, name of the attorney who argued the case for the group trying to overturn the amendment, and he nailed it. He called it a terrible ruling, and today's Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson being the infamous Supreme Court decision in 1896 that ruled that racial segregation by separate but equal was constitutional. Washington added that, quoting him, the Supreme Court has made it clear they want to repeal the gains of the civil rights movement. And no, I do not think that that sentiment is overstated. Consider that back in 2007, in another one of those cases hacking away at affirmative action, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that, quoting him, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. In other words, the way to stop racism in this country is to pretend that racism does not exist. That's what's being claimed here. That's what's being said, and often essentially in so many words. For example, the Attorney General of Michigan declared that the state's ban was about equal treatment because it's fundamentally wrong to treat someone different based on the color of their skin. In other words, racism isn't discrimination. No, no, no. Affirmative action trying to do something about discrimination, uh, about racism, that is discrimination. That is what is treating people differently. Others praise this ruling as moving toward colorblind government. Although one person who argued that seemed to have very acute color vision, she said there was still more to be done at the University of Michigan because it is, she claims, catering to the black student union. That's what's being argued here. The best way for us to deal with racism is to act as if it doesn't exist. The best way to deal with racism is for our public policy to go around with its eyes closed, fingers in its ears, going, la, 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 there is no racism. Just as Sonia Sotomayor wrote a blistering dissent. It was the longest and most significant of her career so far. Which she summarized from the bench, which is an unusual move that members only do when they want to emphasize just how strongly they disagree with the majority. Because, she said, being the majority does not entitle you to rig the game. Significantly, she declared that the stark reality, which is a quote, is that race matters. And she mocked Robert's 2007 quote by saying, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to speak openly and candidly on the subject of race and to apply the Constitution with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. She added that special vigilance is required in the light of the history of slavery, Jim Crow, and recent examples of discriminatory changes to state voting laws. But she was one of only two voices on the court. The, uh, the majority of the court, all males, all but one of them white, 
all seemingly unable, perhaps just unwilling to recognize their own privilege, even when it comes up and taps them on the shoulder, as it has to do in a case like this. That majority preferred to wrap themselves in a fantasy cloaked in sophistry, swinging open wide a door to widespread rollbacks of civil rights gains in higher education and the opportunities that those gains have created, while at the same time claiming that this decision is so limited that it really doesn't mean much of anything at all. It is hard for me to express just how much of an outrage I think this decision is. But I can at least say that it is the outrage of the week. And sort of a little sidebar footnote to this. Um, what I think is perhaps the stupidest comment on this decision was found on the blog of the Rachel Maddow Show on msnbc.com. This, this, this blog said, I'm quoting, In other words, affirmative action in college admissions hasn't been banned. Indeed, the role of considering race in admissions policies remains in place, except in states that choose to prohibit affirmative action policies. In other words, affirmative action still exists every place, except where it doesn't. Yeah, and I am the king of Denmark, everywhere except where I'm not. One of the things that often happens when you have a case like this, and the impact of a case like this, there are always people prepared to downplay it. There are always people prepared to say, oh, it really doesn't mean anything. Oh, it's really just a small thing. Oh, it's really just a tiny difference. But the fact is, if you think small things can't make, there's a great line that said, if you think a small thing can't make a difference, try trying to sleep with a mosquito in the room. Small things matter. Small things add up. Small things make a difference. You can't go around pretending that each decision, oh, this only affects this little thing, without, while, while pretending that it doesn't actually affect anything else. Look, I'm going to stop there with that. I will just tell you one other thing it's, that's going to be coming up. Uh, I have been talked into this. I've been talked into this, and I'm getting a big thumbs up from behind the camera from the person who tried to talk me into it. Um, we are going to start doing a quarterly special, a couple of times a year, probably four times a year, once per season, of and another thing. It's a special show. It's not going to be it's not going to be this show. It's going to be a completely separate show. It's going to all be about cool science stuff. I can't guarantee that there will be nothing political involved because we are going to be talking about things like evolution and global warming in the course of this. But it's also going to be about psychology. It's going to be about, you know, nuclear physics. It's going to be about uh, archaeology. It's going to be about history. It's going to be about any kind of science that I just found cool. All right, so you can look forward to that. Uh, we don't even have a name for it yet, but uh, it will be coming up so in the future, so bear that in mind. But for the moment, I'm just going to sign off. I'm just going to say that um, you have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week, and peace. <laughs>